And I'm going to turn the floor over to Stuart Evans. First, uh, thank all of you for coming. Uh, we're happy to see so many people out there until uh, one of my panelists uh, backstage just mentioned that we're sandwiched between Jim Comey and John Brennan. So I'm sure that's uh, all why you're here. <laughs> but, uh, in listening to the other speakers today, there seem to be a lot of common themes that have been elicited and discussed. And this next panel, we're going to focus probably on some of those same themes. But we're very fortunate to have perspectives from all three branches of government in this next panel. And we're very, very fortunate to have these distinguished speakers with us today. Uh, in particular, I'm very happy to be here because it is a rare experience for me that I get to ask questions of a sitting federal judge and a former congressman. <laughs> so uh, I, I promise to be gentle. Uh, but first, by way of introduction, we have a Judge John Bates, who serves as a United States District Court judge here in the District of Columbia, a position to which he was confirmed in 2001. And of particular relevance for today, uh, he's very well known to many of us for his seven-year term on the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court from 2006 to 2013, including serving as the presiding judge of that court. And then following that period, serving for two years as the director of the administrative office of US courts. We also have with us uh, Congressman Mike Rogers, who represented Michigan's 8th Congressional District in the House of Representatives from 2001 to 2015, and served as chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence from 2011 to 2015, a period which was uh, very instrumental in, uh, in the national security world. Um, also with us is uh, Fran Townsend. Fran served for a number of years in the, uh, the Bush White House, uh, including serving for four years as the Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, and prior to that, as the Deputy Assistant to the President for Combating Counterterrorism. And also relevant for today, uh, she held a number of positions in the Justice Department, including as Acting Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division, and as a Counsel for Intelligence Policy, where she headed the Office of Intelligence Policy and Review OIPR, one of the uh, predecessor organizations to NSD. And also is uh, Rachel Brand is with us. Ms. Brand serves at, on the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, uh, a position she's held since 2012. Uh, prior to that, and again relevant to today, from 2005 to 2007, the period of NSD's creation, she served as the Assistant Attorney General in the Justice Department, heading the Office of Legal Policy, and prior to that as an Associate Counsel in the, uh, the Bush White House. So please join me in wel welcoming all of the panelists. So Fran, I, I thought we would start with you. Um, you served in the White House during the period of time in which the decision was made to endorse the creation of NSD and then during the initial stand up and implementation phase. We've heard earlier from some folks about the perspectives within OIPR and within the criminal division at the time. I'd be curious from your perspective what it was like inside the White House at that time and, and the decision to move forward with NSD. Sure. Interestingly enough, during my time heading OIPR, and I think you heard from Jim Baker, who not only headed the office but had been my deputy, uh, this, there had been a discussion about this inside the Justice Department during the Clinton administration. Now, you, you might imagine I was a career public servant heading OIPR. Um, and we were advocating that with the rise of terrorism, we were seeing this incredible increase in the number of FISA warrants um, during that period of time. And remember, you've got the East Africa Embassy bombing, the coal bombing, and so we're seeing the rise of this. We had advocated that, but there was no political patron who was supporting that, right? The criminal division was at the time headed by a political appointee who viewed it, as you likely heard, as a sort of somehow a diminution of their responsibility. And so, frankly, not for any good or bad reason, the proposal fell by the wayside. So when it, many years later, I'm sitting at the White House, and it comes to me as the President's Homeland Security Advisor, to me, it's kind of a shoulder shrug, right? I thought it was a good idea years ago. I think it's a perfectly good idea now. Um, and so that the White House didn't, the White House in many ways, I think, you could describe it deferred to the Attorney General and the Justice Department. Um, Alice Fisher was the head of the criminal division. She was very supportive. She did not raise objections, at least that I was aware of. The Attorney General supported it. And so it was, there was not a big policy debate. There was kind of nobody on the no side at that point, And it moved forward pretty, pretty easily. Congressman Rogers, I, I was um, struck earlier today. One of the panelists was talking about the fact that uh, Part of the impetus behind NSD was to promote information sharing, tear down the wall between law enforcement and intelligence. 
and the decision was made to do that by creating a new bureaucracy, the National Security yeah. Division. Um, Congress itself isn't particularly known for endorsing additional bureaucracy or expanding the size of departments of ag and agencies, and yet this seemed to be a, a fairly non-controversial decision and fairly bipartisan within Congress. I'd be curious if you have any recollections or thoughts as to, to sure. what, how Congress approached this problem. Well, it was really about unity of effort. So we had just gone through the creation of another bureaucracy called the DNI. Right? So apparently we've gotten pretty good at that in Congress to, to create these. But I do think we saw some value in the unity of effort to try to corral uh, some of the hurdles at, from, from up above the structure. Uh, because under the old system, the DCIA was large and in charge. The president's daily brief was produced through there. There was always this tug and pull from other agencies trying to get their work in the product on the, on the PDB. Uh, and so when, when we went through that exercise, it was a logical extension to most of us to do this because it did present an opportunity to have a unity of effort for what can get really complicated in a hurry. And so I, I thought it, may, it was the next logical step in trying to make sure we're corralling all of our intelligence efforts uh, in, in one space with a streamlined command and control, if you will. And, and Rachel, um, again, we heard the criminal division perspective, the OIPR perspective. You were in a different seat at the time. You were at OLP at the time, which also played a role in, in policy kind of writ large, including the national security space. How do you think the creation of, of NSD was viewed in other components of the department from your seat? Well, I don't think anybody really opposed it. But I, I will say, so I started at the department in 2003 and then became head of OLP in 2005. And especially in the 03, 04, early 05 time frame, I spent almost all of my time on national security issues. So I was working closely with the criminal division, OIPR, ODAG, the FBI, other uh, intelligence agencies. And I frankly didn't perceive some big problem to be solved by NSD. I didn't think OIPR wasn't functioning well. I didn't think CTS or CES wasn't functioning well. Uh, I will say that what I've heard today about the physical manifestation of the tearing down of the wall, uh, that is compelling. You know, and from my seat in OLP, we are doing every policy issue you can think of from drugs to guns to terrorism to everything, so we're, we operate at a pretty high level. So I wasn't witnessing those operational problems that I think NSD has solved. Now, I can also tell you from having been involved in some other organizational changes in the government that sometimes creating a new bureaucracy causes more problems than it solves. So, for example, I was, when I was in the White House, I was on point to write the executive order that created the Office of Homeland Security in the White House. You cannot imagine what a turf battle that was. Now, I think with NSD, that didn't happen, really. It went, it went pretty smoothly, and I think it's worked out pretty well, and it's functioned uh, pretty well. Um, so, in retrospect, I, I think it's been a good development. Fran, I saw you smiling, uh, no doubt, based on your White House experience with the uh, Office of Homeland Security. Do, do you have thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting, right, because what Rachel's talking about had happened by the time I arrived. I don't get there until the spring of 2003, but I kind of, it's sort of walking face first into the buzzsaw. Unaware of the turf battles that had transpired, I walk in, and they're not resolved. There's still this tension about what is the role and responsibility of the department vis-a-vis -vis the, the Homeland Security Council. I had worked, remember when I get there in 2003, I had originally joined the White House as Condi's, Condi Rice's deputy. So the turf battles, to the extent they had existed between the NSC and the HSC, go away because she and I, we've worked together for a year, we know each other well, we respect each other, and so that kind of dissolves. Um, because we share certain staff um, and some responsibilities internationally, but it remained to work out the kind of relationship with the department. That kind of resolves itself. Um, part of that is Tom Ridge had been in the office and then went over to run the department and had a very clear idea in his own mind about how he thought that should work. Um, Tom is a good friend and I respect him tremendously. Mike Chertoff and I, our relationship went back to our time in the Southern District of New York, U.S. Attorney's Office, and so when he comes in, he comes in without a preconceived notion, um, and I think it kind of works its way through uh, during Chertoff's period. Now, 
any organization has a number of different constituencies that they have to deal with. For, for NSD, we deal with the US Attorney's offices, we deal with the intelligence community, the White House, Congress, and the judiciary. Um, Judge Bates, you assumed a role in the, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court in early 2006 after the decision had been made to create NSD, but before it, it had been stood up formally. Be curious if you have thoughts from your perspective as to whether the creation of NSD changed the Justice Department's interaction with the FISC at all? I, th I think it did change it uh, quite a bit, uh, mainly in positive ways in the long run, uh, although uh, anytime there's a, a dramatic change, there, there are some adjustments to get used to. Uh, a large bureaucracy was in the making. It didn't get created overnight, but certainly uh, uh, grew and grew and grew, and with the bureaucracy comes less personal relations uh, between uh, the uh, legal advisors and uh, members of the court uh, and uh, uh, those from the Department of Justice working on matters. Uh, perhaps uh, there was a risk of a little less political accountability uh, with an assistant attorney general uh, now having, uh, uh, quite frankly, the primary role uh, and the attorney general having much less of a role, whereas before that, uh, the Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General were more involved in reviewing applications uh, and uh, uh, in various matters that came up. Uh, but I think uh, it's allowed more focus uh, uh, on applications, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, it probably led to, uh, initially at least, uh, many more applications coming to the court uh, that were, shall we say, the backlog uh, that needed to be addressed uh, that hadn't uh, been uh, uh, approved uh, within the Department of Justice uh, before that, uh, and some of those uh, uh, needed careful scrutiny. Uh, but I think in, in the long run, it worked out uh, uh, very well. I will say that the creation of NSD is not in a vacuum. As Mike said, other things were going on. Uh, the DNI, you had the NCTC being created. You had changes in the, uh, uh, in the FBI, both structurally and in terms of focus. Uh, you had the growth of NSA. Uh, and you had the movement of the court. The court was located in the Department of Justice. Uh, and and uh, it was uh, about two years after the creation of NSD that we moved the court out of the Department of Justice over to the courthouse uh, for not just appearances sake, but we thought it was a necessary uh, step. My uh, predecessor as uh, presiding judge and myself uh, thought that that was uh, something that just had to be done. Uh, to uh, ensure the uh, independence of the uh, court. Uh, and all those changes, I think, have uh, made for a, a, a better process. But uh, NSD in particular, uh, with a large bureaucracy come some problems, but I think those have all worked out. You, uh, you touched on an interesting point there about the role of other agencies, and you know, today being about the NSD 10-year anniversary, we've obviously uh, focused on, on, on NSD, but I want to touch on the FBI for a minute. Um, Congressman Rogers, uh, you served as an FBI special agent uh, earlier in your career, and then in your role on HIPSI, uh, conducted significant oversight of the FBI during the period in which it was transforming itself from a law enforcement-driven agency to an intelligence agency. I'd be curious for your thoughts on, on how NSD has really complemented that change that, that the FBI has made and how significant that was. Yeah, and before we do that, I just want to compliment the judge. When we were going through some interesting times on the committee, the judge was very gracious to come down and provide some insight for us to get it right. The, the NSA contractor issue may, may come up, may come to mind for someone. That's a year of my life I'd like back, by the way. <laughs> Um, and the judge was very good about coming up, didn't have to do it, but they agreed to come up and walk through some of the processes so that when we were trying to reform it, we got it right. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if I ever had the public opportunity to thank you for that. You've invested that time and didn't have to. I told him I'd give him a subpoena, but he said, you have Capitol Police, I have marshals. Uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> so he won that fight. <laughs> and, and he's not mentioning all the times that uh, either I or others declined to come. Yeah, to talk to <laughs> there was a lot of those. So that's why I was so thankful when you did show up. It was great. Um, you know, the FBI did go through some very significant cultural changes. Um, and, you know, some for the better, some I think there's still some a question mark about where they're at. And they took a tremendous amount of resources from criminal work and shifted it to the counterterrorism mission, a lot of them, and it happened fast. And so when it happens that fast, by the time I became chairman, it was time to maybe get out the screwdriver and try to adjust that back a little bit because they had to, through everything they had at the problem, and I don't disagree with the decision to do that, 
Uh, but there comes a point when you have to right that ship a little bit. So we were going through that whole thing. I think the relationship now is so much better uh, between the agencies. We also applied uh, an analyst role that was real and meaningful to the FBI that didn't exist before. And that is a cultural change. If someone would have told me as a young case agent working a case in Chicago uh, that I had an analyst that was going to help me plan my day, I can't even use the terminology I would have used uh, back then, right? It was just unheard of. We wouldn't have done it. It was case agent and everyone else. And that needed to change. If you're going to get a better product from the FBI, you had to have that analyst integration. And they did that. And it had some fits and starts. And, and with the creation of the division, I think that it helped tremendously refocus the FBI and how they conduct those investigations, where they go. And it developed a level of expertise that you sometimes don't get in a U.S. attorney somewhere. That's not a bad, that's not a negative. Uh, it's just what it is. They may be working an organized crime case uh, and somebody walks in with a counterterrorism case. The elements are different. And so having the NSD, I think, was very helpful in getting that cadre of people focused and the level of expertise to help those investigations. So at the end of the day, it was bumpy. We had some bumps along the way. But I think that was a very worthwhile process. And now, because of that, uh, agents know who to call. Uh, they know who to talk to. The prosecutors know who to call. They know who to talk to. Uh, and I think that, in and of itself, is a huge value in those what can be very quick investigations sometimes. You know, Judge, I'd be curious for your reactions to that. In your role, you're charged often with looking at the thoroughness of the investigation and how the facts are coming together. Is that something that you've seen a change in from your optic looking at the investigations? Well, I, I think there's been a change. Uh, it's not like a night and day change. Uh, but uh, uh, as uh, has been said by others, uh, anytime there's a greater group of people, uh, they're able to focus particularly uh, on uh, the area and on the matter. Uh, and I think that that uh, uh, enhances the quality, uh, both coming from the FBI or another uh, intelligence community agency, uh, and uh, then adds to the scrutiny that uh, is applied uh, within the Department of Justice at NSD. Uh, and uh, all we need uh, is uh, uh, you know, to increase the size of the court uh, by a couple of factors and add legal advisors, and we'll be able to handle the work with no problem. But yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's improved things. Uh, but, but that's not to criticize the job that was done in the past. There's been a lot of focus today, I think, on the tearing down of the wall and, and NSD being the, uh, the physical manifestation of that. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit to some of the other benefits that, that NSD brings. Um, you know, Fran, from a policy perspective, you spent many years sitting around the, the sit room table uh, dealing with weighty decisions. Do you feel as if the existence of, of NSD has brought something different to that table, to the interagency, to the White House policymaking process? So. Again, I can only compare it to my time during the Clinton administration. I was in the Justice Department. Oftentimes when the Attorney General, at that time Attorney General Reno, would get prepared, there were a number of people around that table to prepare her. Um, it was, at the time, the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel. Um, there was probably uh, the, deputy, the Assistant Deputy Attorney General for National Security. Um, and then there was the, the uh, Counsel for Intelligence Policy. And so all those people brought different pieces to that preparation before she'd go to the White House. It was clear to me when I was in the White House, at the time Attorney General Ashcroft would turn to, once after the creation of the National Security Division, that assistant attorney general. That was somebody we, I came to interact with and know. That was someone in Homeland, as the assistant for Homeland Security advising the president that I interacted with. Um, and it, it was a much more integrated, seamless process. That person has a real role in terms of advising the Attorney General uh, on positions to be taken at the, at the Homeland Security and National Security Council. You know, hearing you say that, I'm struck by the fact that uh, two of your successors in that role at the White House, Ken Weinstein and Lisa Monaco, uh, both of whom were former Assistant Attorney Generals, were here today. What, what does it tell you that there have been a trend of including yourself, uh, three folks who've come out of that Justice Department mold who, who've held uh, that position at the White House. In some ways, I think the general public ought to take comfort from that, right? These are people, all three of us were people who were, have enormous love and regard for the Constitution, understood American constitutional rights and the role the Constitution plays in a very serious and sort of dangerous area. Um, 
but I, and I also think we brought with it the fact that you can't be in that job and not be very familiar with the, both the legal authorities and the capabilities of the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA, all of which play a critical role in the counterterrorism area. And so you've been exposed to all the necessary tools in the toolkit, and it gives you a, a different perspective in terms of advising the president. Another, uh, another area where NSD really contributes, in addition to kind of legal advice and, and uh, collection authorities, is in the oversight realm. And oversight is something that uh, the Justice Department has always conducted with respect to intelligence activities, but the creation of NSD has really enabled a economies of scale and, and additional resources that can be brought to bear on that. You know, Rachel, in, in your capacity on PCLOB, oversight is, is a, a key function of what you do there. I, I'd be curious for your thought as to how NSD fits in into the overall oversight regime of the intelligence community. Well, it has an interesting, perhaps unique role. So I, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about how to do oversight right, and your big picture is that you've got oversight of intelligence programs by all three branches of the government, but it has to start in the executive branch because if there aren't serious compliance and oversight mechanisms in the executive branch, then no offense to Congressman Rogers or Judge Bates, but no amount of oversight by Congress or the judiciary would be sufficient because they are not in the day-to-day -day operation of the agencies. They don't have the resources to do that, although they carry very big sticks in terms of authority to, to shut things down. Um, and then within the executive branch, you have oversight within agencies, and then you've got sort of quasi-independent oversight, so PCLOB being independent, um, general counsel's office in the agency being within the chain of command. Uh, and you have to have a mix of both because there are upsides and downsides to both, but NSD actually is both at the same time in a way because it's within the president's administration, so it's much more comfortable for NSD to be really in the day-to-day -day business of the overseen agencies in a way that doesn't violate privileges and that where the president, the White House can enforce that interaction. Um, and at the same time, NSD is part of the Attorney General's apparatus, which has always been viewed to have that independent role. And I you know, think back to working with uh, Jim Baker when he was head of OIPR. I assume it's still similar, but there was, there was a quasi-antagonistic relationship between, maybe not just quasi, um, antagonistic relationship between OIPR and the Bureau and other agencies where, um, although it was within the department and within the administration, it, was, it did have that kind of independent check aspect to it, so. So a slightly tougher follow-up for you, speaking of quasi-antagonistic relationships, uh, PCLOB is somewhat of the new kid on the block mm -hmm. for oversight, uh, coming into a well-established oversight regime. How have you found it uh, dealing with the intelligence community and kind of establishing PCLOB's uh, role in the oversight process that you just outlined? Well, <laughs> uh, it's, it's gone pretty well. Uh, we've, we've had really good relationships with uh, most of the agencies most of the time. There have been growing pains. Uh, we have not always gotten what we wanted, um, and we continue to work through that. But there's, um, I think PCLOB is a good idea. It, it, it has promise. I think we'll get there. But um, when you're dealing with classified intelligence programs where you are squarely within the president's core constitutional authorities or to act as commander in chief and to, to run foreign policy and so forth, it is um, a little strange to have what is sort of, what is a, a semi-independent agency, right? The, the president controls classified information. We're supposed to have access to classified information and yet we don't actually have a legal authority to get it if an agency refuses. And so we have to work with the agencies somewhat collaboratively to get what we need. And, and I, like I said, it's going pretty well, um, but you know, we're working on it. Stu, can I add a word on uh, oversight uh, from the judicial perspective? Uh, from the, for the judiciary, which is not the primary uh, body to have oversight over the process, uh, but it does have a role with respect to compliance, which is a fairly substantial part uh, of oversight. Uh, and uh, that has increased over the years. Uh, I think NSD uh, has been a very valuable contributor uh, and has been able to focus more on compliance. And by compliance, I mean mainly compliance with the law and with court orders uh, in the uh, FISA process before the, 
uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Uh, but uh, the court has been very engaged in that, and it's an important uh, part of what the uh, court does. We get, nowadays, many, many compliance issues are raised. They're raised by NSD, which informs the court. It's obliged to inform the court. Many of them disappear fairly quickly, but some are much more substantial. And indeed, some of the most substantial opinions of the court that have been uh, uh, released publicly over the past few years are really compliance opinions. They're decisions addressing problems uh, in the compliance arena that uh, came up with the FBI, with the NSA, or whatever agency. Uh, and I think that's a, a part of oversight that uh, the court plays an important role in, and NSD uh, plays a fundamental uh, role in bringing those matters to the attention of the court and working with the intelligence agencies to examine, develop, uh, and uh, uh, improve. There are, uh, there are many on the outside who have not seen the inner workings of the process who are, I think, skeptical of the executive branch's ability to self-identify and, and self-report problems uh, to the judiciary. As someone who has seen that process work, do you have thoughts on, on the effectiveness of it? I would say it's not perfect at all times, but I think it's pretty good. I think uh, uh, there are now compliance offices, substantial compliance offices within uh, the uh, agencies that make up uh, the intelligence community. They take their role seriously. NSD has a substantial compliance uh, uh, office, if you will, and it uh, works very hard. So I, I think the process uh, works, but it's, it's going to be imperfect. Uh, it's a very complex uh, area, uh, and uh, there's uh, lots that goes on, and identifying where there are compliance problems takes quite a bit of effort, uh, and as I said, it will be imperfect. But I think, uh, I think it works pretty well, and the court certainly takes it seriously as well. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, for folks that don't really appreciate the history, OIPR, I arrived there, I want to say it was in 1998, somewhere in there, um, and I don't think I had six or eight lawyers, right? There, were, there was not a computer system, an independent computer system. Um, when I got there, they were doing it on the old legal size paper that they had literally requisitioned and put in pallets in the basement because it didn't make it anymore. The legal profession, every other court had done away with it. Um, they were working on selector typewriters. So you took the, you know, the ball out and the tape out at night. I mean, this was a very small office. That, I tell you that because compliance, as the judges described it, was an ancillary duty. It was one other assignment that they had to fit in in addition to processing the FISA requests from the FBI. And so with the creation of the National Security Division, you have a staff now. It's been not institutionalized, and there are people devoted whose responsi full-time responsibility it is to do this. And that was another, frankly, that's another benefit to, to the resources and the creation of the division. I would just add as well, I mean, I, for people who don't know the inside, there is lots and lots and lots of people looking over shoulders. You think of the compliance office, you have the court, you have the IGs in each agency, the IG for the intelligence community, you have each program manager in my committee is, was uh, charged with oversight and compliance review, uh, and then you have the NSD looks at it, the PCLOB looks at it. So some notion that there's a bunch of freewheeling intelligence, matter of fact, they would argue if you, if you really get them in, in the bar with a drink, enough already, right? Let us do something for God's sake. And so we have really beefed up all of our ability to try to catch something early. And that's really the whole idea here. It's not because they're doing something wrong, but you wanna catch that train coming off the rail early so you can get it back on the rail and continue to work. And I, I just, there's lots going on in that. I think that fact is one of the many uh, aspects of intelligence programs that is not understood by the public. I think there really has been a public perception that the IC is the Wild West operating without rules, which could not be further from the truth for, for the reasons you say. So, you know, something that I've spent a lot of time doing since I've been on the P Club is talking about that, including in Europe with European governments, explaining the extensive system of oversight that we have in, in the United States. And I think that needs to be better understood in the public than it is now. So a, a follow-up question to that back to any of you. 
what more do you think we can be doing to accomplish that? You know, we, we do panels like this, we do other things where we talk about uh, the acronyms, OIGs, uh, P clubs, things like that. Is there a way that the executive branch can be better explaining, better messaging the, the rigorousness and, and robustness of the oversight to the public to give them that confidence? I think it has to be done by people who are not in the government, to be completely honest, because there is a, an understandable, perhaps, reluctance in the public to just take the government's word for it. The government says the government's great. That's not necessarily all that persuasive. But, but, um, but there are a lot of, um, I think, a lot of other voices that could be talking about it more. Or you could have one of these conferences every year <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> advertising yeah. to the public that way. I, I think the organizers would uh, resist that. It's a lot of work. I do think there's a bit of a double-edged sword here because we talk a lot about all of the oversight. So you think, well, they must be, my gosh, they have 18 hall monitors between the classroom and the restroom. Uh, something's going on. And so there's this, this double-edged sword to this because, A, I do think those, those functions actually work and they work well. Uh, and there's mechanisms to get it from compliance, hopefully not to the IG, but if it needs the IG, it's there, or, or uh, program managers in our committee, or the NSD. There's lots of mechanisms to get it out to try to correct it before it gets a problem. And it sounds like so much, and it is. You worry sometimes about talking about how much it is, thinking, my God, what were they doing all this other time? So it is a double-edged sword. And I, I, most of the intelligence agencies I work with do understand the value of it. And they did finally come around to the notion that this is good for you because it allows you to do your job knowing that you have the full weight and support of both legal authorities uh, and the moral support of your government when you're doing this work. To me, that was the most important accomplishment in all of this. And to do that, you had to build in enough redundancy to make it accurate. But there's that double-edged sword. Speaking of oversight, uh, one of the most heavily overseen and, and publicly discussed uh, intelligence programs out there is the Section 702 program of the, uh, the FISA Amendments Act, the FAA, um, which comes up for reauthorization by Congress at the end of 2017. Um, Congressman Rogers, I know you were heavily involved uh, at the last reauthorization, and uh, Rachel, I know PCLAB uh, conducted an extensive oversight review of the program uh, back in 2014. So I'd be curious for your thoughts as to where you see the, the reauthorization discussion heading in, in the coming year. Well, I mean, every time it comes up, it's going to be a political hot potato. Just in there. And part of the problem was, and we noticed this when the NSA contractor uh, stole information and disclosed it uh, in a way that I thought was harmful to our national security, is that the political narrative or the narrative on the conversation got way ahead of what the facts were. And that became fact. It became real. And so you were always out trying to explain why, no, no, that, that, that's not really the way it works. No, there was oversight. No, there was legal review. No, there, and it was really difficult because, as you said, we were, you know, I'm here, I'm with the government, I'm here to help you. You know, trust me. Program's great. Uh, was just a terrible narrative for us to try to catch up on. And I don't think we're over that hangover yet, candidly. I think, you know, the, 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 when you look at all of the challenges we face in cyberspace today, and, you know, we're making it this new domain of warfare, uh, coming up, I think the president is probably going to separate the NSA and Cyber Command, and I think that's the right decision to do that. So you have this new warfare domain, lots of mystery in it. So when this comes up, they're thinking, you know, there is a Hoover sucking up everybody's personal information, and I type in a keyword, and I know what you had for breakfast this morning. And there, there's a fundamental belief of that, not understanding all the rigors of all of the review, including judicial review on these activities, and reoccurring judi judicial review, plus committee uh, legislative review automatically on these programs, plus NSD review. I mean, there's lots of review on this to make sure we don't, our intelligence services don't get it right. But I'll guarantee you, you watch this thing going into that, and the things that they say the intelligence community are doing with that information, you know, I always thought, boy, if we were ever that really good, well, we wouldn't have a problem. And the problem is we just did they didn't have access to it. So I, I think, again, you're going to watch it happen. Again, I think there's a movie coming out. That's going to cause a, a, a misperception of what's happening. I'll tell you a quick story. I go home during that whole thing. I have a town hall meeting. I explain it stem to stern. I go right up to the line on classified information so people have a good understanding, because I, I was the chairman at the time. It was a little uncomfortable, as you might imagine. So I go through the whole thing. Explain it in great detail, take questions for an hour and a half, and at the end of it, 
They said, well, we trust you, but we know they're still doing it. Right? I thought, I don't, I, I don't know, I give, I don't know what to do. And so that's the problem. There's this perception that it's happening and that perception has become reality. You watch the fight that happens, uh, I think, coming up. And, and debate is good, but based on facts, if we could all agree on the same set of facts, it'd be a great debate. We never quite agree on the same set of facts. Yeah, I agree with the Congressman. One of the things that really struck me after, after the leaks was the just a real, really pervasive misunderstanding of facts in the public. And in, in part that happened, I think, because of the way the leaks were conducted, which was over time and, um, you know, not every aspect of the program was leaked and um, the good parts were not disclosed until later. Uh, so, and also these things are extremely complex, as, as Judge Bates was saying. So it's hard for any even educated, informed, interested person to understand, right? Um, so there were the factual understandings about the program itself, but then something that's really struck me today listening to a lot of my old friends here on, on the previous panels, there's been a lot of discussion about information sharing, taking down the wall. Um, these are things that, the importance of these things are obvious to almost everybody, or if not everyone in this room, they are not obvious to people outside this room. I think people either never understood or have forgotten the fundamental paradigm shift that happened in the intelligence community after 9-11 to improve information sharing. I think also people, there is a lack of understanding of some really basic aspects of how the intelligence community does work. I think there's a perception out there, for example, that you know, counterterrorism is about catching known bad guy after a terrorist attack happened. But people don't understand that it's actually a preventive, long-term, forward-looking enterprise. And that skews perceptions. People also don't understand what foreign intelligence is for. They think it's just the, the, the known bad guy terrorist. They don't realize it's for um, a whole range of other purposes, including cyber and counterintelligence and so forth. So if the public um, reads stories uh, that are, you know, 500 words and don't have an understanding of a lot of those bigger themes, it's not that surprising that they'll come away with a skewed perception of what's going on. So whether it's the administration or folks on the outside, I think there does need to be an effort to help the public understand the broader context of the debate. Judge, given the extensive role that the, uh, the FISC plays in the 702 program, do you have uh, thoughts on, on this area? Well, I don't have uh, any uh, thoughts on what the substance of the debate uh, will be or uh, should be or what any legislative uh, changes uh, might be. Uh, it does seem to me 702 has changed a little bit with respect to the court. The court has uh, slightly more enhanced roles, shall we say, in terms of what uh, uh, it is reviewing and doing. Uh, and, and that seems to be working well. I'm an outsider. I'm not on the court now, so I don't see it uh, in any uh, uh, official or day-to-day -day, uh, capacity, but it seems to be working well. Uh, I'm sure the debate will be uh, uh, an interesting one, whether uh, the country or uh, the Congress uh, has the stomach uh, to uh, make any significant change uh, to uh, uh, another aspect of uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act remains to be seen. Uh, last time uh, when that happened, culminating in the USA Freedom Act, uh, it took a long time and a lot of uh, debate. Uh, and uh, I, I was involved somewhat from the judiciary's perspective, but in commenting on operational things, not in commenting on the substance uh, of uh, legislative proposals or consideration. Uh, that was the only other time uh, that I uh, actually did uh, agree to appear uh, on the Hill uh, in a classified uh, uh, context uh, to which all senators were invited. And about, almost, about 50 senators showed up for it. Uh, but uh, hopefully uh, that will not happen on my watch again. That no one shows up. No, <laughs> <laughs> that I show up. <laughs> You, uh, you mentioned the, uh, the USA Freedom Act and, uh, and, and the changes that were made. The, the changes to the, the FISA process uh, made by the USA Freedom Act were some of the most significant ones we've seen uh, since FISA's original enactment, namely the provision of the, the possibility of the appointment of an amicus in, in certain cases. Um, there were opinions on both sides of that. There were some in the privacy and civil liberties community that felt that that authority didn't go far enough. And there were some within the, the executive branch in Congress who thought that that authority went too far. Uh, without commenting on any particular matters, from the perspective of a judge, how do you feel that law shook out in terms of giving a judge 
the authority he or she may need to, to bring in outside expertise where appropriate? I think the, the judges on the uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court and the Court of Review uh, have both utilized that uh, process uh, in the year and a half or so that it's existed. Uh, and uh, I think are pretty satisfied uh, with the occasions where they've utilized it. Uh, and uh, it was, as you say, somewhat of a compromise. Uh, it wasn't uh, the uh, creation of a permanent uh, uh, advocate, uh, either within the executive branch or within uh, the uh, court, uh, but this uh, opportunity for the appointment of an amicus and the creation of a panel of uh, uh, amici who uh, were cleared and uh, uh, qualified and ready to take on that responsibility. So I think, I think that the, the sense of things is that it's worked pretty well. I think we need a little more time uh, to see. There, uh, even though it's been utilized, that the number of times still is pretty limited uh, because it really focuses on uh, novel uh, uh, changes in the law or uh, uh, approaches to the law or even techno technological issues. Uh, and they don't come up every day. Most applications do not involve uh, that kind of uh, uh, unusual legal issue or uh, uh, technical issue uh, that would require an amicus. So I, I think it will take a little more time. Uh, but the operational uh, uh, effects on the court have not been negative as far as I can tell. Uh, it, we, you know, they have to look at things a little more carefully to make that decision initially whether to appoint an amicus. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't think that's been too burdensome. I, I, I've just, I, being involved in that entire process, uh, there was, uh, based on misinformation, they really wanted to go after the court by, make, by institutionalizing certain activities in the court that now a judge would have full discretion over. I, I just thought it was a little bit ridiculous. And that's again, was based on misinformation about how the court worked, what the court's function was, and you were working against yourself because it was a secret court, right? That already you go, mm-hmm, secret court. Uh-huh, I know what's going on in there. And the problem was that we, 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 were, we, had our, we were handcuffed a little bit, and that's why the, the judge came in and walked us through operational details of the court so that other members might understand that as an FBI agent, it may take me 10 drafts of my affidavit, maybe 15. I, DOJ used to drive me crazy as a young agent, right? I wanted to get in there and get in front of the judge yesterday and go, oh, you gotta actually prove your point. I'm like, I, you know, who would have thunk that? Yeah. And so agents now have a pretty self-regulated event to make sure that those affidavits are right. So if you go in and you get it kicked out by the judge, trust me, that's about the worst day of your life because that thing has been spot, specced a lot, both internally to the FBI or the agency that was making the submission, right? and the DOJ, uh, and the attorney who's working on it, uh, and a collection of FBI agents at the coffee shop in the morning who just want to give you their opinion on what you ought to put in there. It is a really, really tough document. So by the time it reaches the judge, this is a thoroughly, thoroughly reviewed document. So if you get kicked out at that point, you have done something probably pretty wrong, candidly. Matter of fact, a lot of people in the community argue, hey, you're self-regulating too much. You know, let the judge make that decision. Uh, and a lot of people make this argument. So that was all happening all at the same time. And then because it was a secret court, people want to keep on these requirements on you would do on no other judge in any other criminal matter. I mean, that's the judge's purview in my mind. And so that was the public debate that we had both internally and publicly about, hey, we need to make sure that the judge can be the judge. Uh, and we continue to do what we do and try to explain why there isn't this rejection rate. They all wanted to measure it by the rejection rate which is really a crazy statistic uh, for a FISA warrant. I mean, it really makes it's no, no basis in reality on the rejection rate because of all the activities that happen. Up to it. Let me just expand on that a little bit. Uh, Mike's absolutely right, in absolutely right in terms of the care that is taken. Uh, statistically, uh, in the last couple of years, their statistics have been kept with respect to uh, FISA applications to the uh, court. Uh, and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, uh, mention that. Uh, and uh, it basically has shown that uh, uh, somewhere in the 20 to 25 percent usually uh, of uh, applications uh, are modified in some significant way. I don't mean typos, but I mean uh, deleting a target, uh, 
rejecting a legal theory, but there might be more than one legal theory in support of an application, uh, uh, requiring more facts, uh, either further explanation provided factually or the development of further facts before uh, an application is approved. The last statistics I saw, which do not include 702 applications, I think showed uh, that in the second half of 2015, uh, somewhat, something just over 17% of applications were significantly modified or rejected. Now, it's only a small number that were rejected. I think it was five for that period. Uh, and, and rejection means either the court rejected them or the court told NSD it was going to reject them and NSD decided not to go forward with the application. Uh, just for comparative purposes, Title III, of course, is the law enforcement analog uh, where uh, applications for wiretaps uh, come before federal judges. Uh, there have been years where, by the statistics reported, not a single Title III application was denied nationally. The process for FISA applications is much more thorough. Not, not to fault the Title III process, but the process for FISA applications is much more thorough than the Title III process. You, you can feel free to fault the criminal division here. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I, I see uh, we're, we're getting a little close on our time. I wanted to shift gears a little bit. Um, when we started this discussion, Congressman, you, you described NSD as the next logical step following the post-9-11 reforms in our fight against terrorism. Um, you, in particular, I know, have been very vocal about the cyber threat that we now face as a nation as, as we transition to that. What do you see as the next logical step the government needs to take in, in fighting the, the forthcoming cyber threat? Yeah, I th we haven't quite got cyber sharing right just yet. Um, and some of that was, uh, again, a little bit of hangover from the NSA contractor about what that cyber sharing bill looked like. A couple of key components of that, liability. We have to give companies liability protection if they're in a, in a legitimate way sharing information to stop bad things from happening to all of us. Uh, we had some of that. I argue we need to strengthen that. Uh, and we need to get, it needs to be machine to machine in real time. I, I think there was an artificial carve out on where that information sh should go. And I always argued, why would we put, take our best player off the field, which was the NSA. And I understand the concerns that has a de Department of Defense uh, leaning, I think that's going to go away here pretty soon if you get those two divisions. Uh, I would argue it, get them in the loop. They don't have to control it, they shouldn't collect it, that, we should, that should be overseen vigorously, but we should allow that machine-to-machine real-time sharing because they can see things overseas uh, that even some of the best cyber guys in the world can't see, right, because it's their mission to go find bad things somewhere. Uh, and when they bring it back, these artificial hurdles, we still have a few, of getting that in in a classified way so that companies don't get burdened with that malicious source code. And the sad part is, you just kind of watch it happen. I mean, it was always my biggest frustration. Uh, because of legal hurdles to watch an attack vector coming in, uh, and the intelligence community had to say, oop, that looks bad, call the FBI. And by the FBI tent gets there, they knock on the door and go, guess what, clean up on aisle nine. Right? It's already there, the damage is done. And so what we are trying to do is, can you intercede with that earlier? We're gonna have to get this right. We haven't quite gotten it right yet. I do think the split will help, uh, and that's what I would do. Cyber sharing is gonna be the single most important thing that the government can do to, to beat back cybercrime and, and espion economic espionage as well, and destructive attacks. <laughs> Other than that, it's fine, don't worry about it. Use your <laughs> device right now. Um, Fran, pivoting to you on that question, you know, you've been in the private sector now for a few years. Um, from the private sector perspective, what are we doing wrong? What do we need to do more of in the cyber area? So with, I, I don't disagree with what Mike said. I, I would add a footnote, however. Um, the perception in the private sector is when the government doesn't know what to do next, they look to reorganize, right? They're going to change the org chart when what they really need to do is tackle the difficult legal policy questions about who's got the authority to do what and when, and then to communicate that clearly so that the private sector knows who am I supposed to talk to, what are my liability exposure and protections, 
Um, and the government's not been clear about that. I, I, the one example I'll point to quickly is the dedicated denial of service attacks in the lead up to the decision about Iran negotiations. The, the financial community in New York went to, came to Washington and said, we are getting killed. Uh, you've got to act or we've got to act. And of course, the government's answer was, oh, no, no, we're not going to, and please don't you, because you may trigger some retaliatory action uh, that will screw up the bilateral discussion. Well, that's unacceptable. I sit on three public boards. We, pu public directors on boards have a fiduciary responsibility. And so the government kind of doesn't get that or doesn't care. Um, and that's a problem, understanding what the rules of the road are, when the government's going to act, and when the private sector can act, and to what extent, is really important. And I think, as opposed to we're currently focused on the organization inside the government, what the private sector needs is a better and clearer articulation of roles and responsibilities. So with that, um I think we'll go ahead and open it up to questions for a few minutes if there are uh, folks who have questions. For the panelists, not for me, to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> We'd prefer you ask him. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, as, uh, thank you. As the um, uh, former uh, Assistant Attorney General uh, Brand uh, previously mentioned, a common theme amongst uh, several of the panelists and keynote speakers today has been the concept of using information uh, jointly among the intelligence and law enforcement communities. Uh, just to go one step further, I'd be interested to hear your opinion in regards to the issue of how to, I guess, most appropriately determine the best use of that information once it's shared. So for example, in the intelligence community, that necessitates a great deal of anonymity and secrecy in regards to the human sources of that information, whereas uh, in the law enforcement community to facilitate an effective uh, criminal conviction, um, that information would then have to convert to testimonial evidence and subject to the confrontation clause. Um, how, f first of all, I is there tension in that regard between both communities? Uh, has the establishment of the National Security Division alleviated some of those tensions? And which methods have you seen either directly or indirectly uh, that are most appropriate uh, to navigate uh, that issue? Um, so I would say to you, yes, there is a natural tension between the two communities. Um, I do think that the FBI, with the, the, their counterterrorism division and national security capabilities, and I kind of had a front row seat right to that transformation in the FBI, has come to grips with how do you deal with the most sensitive information, right? We went from a period in the intelligence community of access based on need to know, and then there, we transformed ourselves to the other end of the spectrum. There was inevitably going to be a balancing about need to share, and then you have a Robert Hansen, right? And so you understand that some secrets absolutely must be protected. Um, the tension to me came up most poignantly with the establishment of the Department of Homeland Security. And I was always accused by Secretary Ridge of always siding with the FBI uh, because I had originally come from the Justice Department. That's always a good decision. <laughs> <laughs> because the FBI couldn't risk in a sensitive investigation if they shared it with DHS of having a leak. And there had been in the early going that history. Um, so it's a long way to say to you, I think that the Bureau actually is the, the man in the middle who understands best how to share information, particularly based on your experience in the Joint Terrorism Task Forces with state and locals, to get the information to a tactical level where somebody can deal with it while protecting your most sensitive sources. And I think that you've, the FBI's earned the credibility with the CIA that it's a much more, you know, you just heard Jim Comey talk about having CIA officers embedded in the FBI's counterterrorism capability. I think as a result of your ability to bridge that and prove yourselves to protect the most sensitive secrets, the FBI's really become the bridge there. 
I, I would add in response to that, just from an NSD perspective, I, I think one of the other benefits to the wall coming down and, and the creation of NSD is that in the prior era, when prosecutors needed to deal with these evidentiary issues, they were perhaps met with a little bit of suspicion or perhaps distrust by the intelligence community who may have felt as if they didn't understand or, or fully appreciate intelligence sources and methods. And, and now having those prosecutors and the intelligence lawyers all under one roof in NSD enables us to work with the FBI and go to the intelligence community and kind of advocate that we understand all of those equities and are looking for the, the right approach that balances them. Um, and that's certainly been my experience from the judicial perspective, uh, that uh, uh, those tensions exist, but uh, uh, NSD has helped. And, and I don't really mean uh, as a FISA judge, I mean as a regular uh, federal uh, district judge uh, uh, with criminal cases that may have uh, uh, FISA information or other classified information. There's a process, of course. The Classified Information Procedures Act is largely the process that helps uh, uh, get everyone through uh, that uh, difficulty and tension. Sometimes, uh, and, uh, uh, I've had this in civil cases as well. Sometimes uh, uh, the involved agency is really insistent uh, on not revealing information in some civil cases. I would say probably the most acute examples personally that I can think of were not just human sources, but foreign governmental human sources. And those are very difficult situations, uh, but uh, uh, everyone just has to you know, put their a shoulder to the wheel and uh, get through it. Well, thank you all, and uh, appreciate your time. And a big round of applause for our speakers. Your Honor, it's always great to see you. Great to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Everything you. going well? Yeah, it is. I'm doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move uh, directly into the next session. If you can keep your seats. Thank you. Yes, you can stand in place. I wanted to uh, welcome uh, to our 10-year 
Director Brennan. Director uh, Brennan has a long and distinguished career as an intel intelligence analyst uh, who began his career, I believe, more than 25 years, uh, 25 years ago and served in a variety of positions at the agency, uh, assumed the role as the first head of the National Counterterrorism Center, has served as President Obama's first assistant uh, to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, and now, of course, of course, serves as the director of the CIA. So please uh, join me in giving him a warm welcome. <laughs> Let me start by uh, uh, asking you, you the experience of serving um, at the time of September 11th in the prior administration and then serving as the head of the National Counterterrorism Center prior to the creation of the National Security Division of the Department of Justice. And then you returned to the administration and there was this new, this new entity, uh, NSD in the table, and just ask uh, how you saw the before and after. I think in the aftermath of 9-11, we were all trying to adjust and adapt to the new reality in terms of the seriousness and the breadth of the uh, threats that were coming at us. And I think each agency and organization and department had to go through a fair amount of sort of internal review and then adjustment. So I, I left the, uh, the CIA back in 2005, and as you say, I came back then with the president in 2009. And what I found was that this new entity, the National Security Division at uh, Justice, was really the, the connective tissue between justice and the, the broader national security establishment and environment. And that there was now a, a focal point and a, uh, a portal through which we could really work from a national security perspective with the broader justice uh, workforce as well as organization. And I found that it really facilitated a lot of the interaction, but also uh, helped in the translation and interpretation of that uh, interaction between uh, intelligence and law enforcement. And I had the great good fortune to work with uh, a number of uh, your predecessors, uh, David Chris, who I see standing back there, uh, and then Lisa Monaco, and now you. And there was a, a go-to person in justice uh, at NSD that I could talk to and who could really understand and relate to what it was that intelligence uh, or we were trying to, to do or accomplish and how we're going to be able to satisfy the collective missions of the U.S. government, which include law enforcement, prosecution, intelligence, collection, uh, working with our partners, how we're going to really try to sort out all of these various considerations as we try to keep the American public safe. So uh, as good as justice was earlier on in terms of trying to do everything possible after 9-11 to facilitate that interaction, I found that the stand-up of NSD really did help from the standpoint of interoperability, interaction, uh, and translation, and finding options that I think um, were able to address the considerations of both the the Justice Department, as well as the intelligence community. The, uh, take, us, take us into the room a little bit. You're in the, you're in the Oval Office. You have to brief uh, a president who's a former constitutional law professor on a variety of national security issues that involve uh, both operational aspects, but also legal uh, aspects. How did you prepare uh, to do those, um, those briefings, and how did you balance the different uh, equities? Uh, you mentioned that I've, I've been in this business for more than 25 years. I hate to reveal my age, but I've been in this business for more than 35 years. So I had 25 years at CIA that I was able to really work through a number of these issues from an operational, analytic uh, perspective. And when President Obama assumed office in January of 2009, uh, I think one of the, the benefits that maybe I brought to the discussion was an appreciation for how the intelligence community and how CIA operated and some of the considerations when you're talking about operations and covert action and our engagement with a lot of our liaison partners. And uh, the president, as we all know, is an exceptionally quick study. 
Uh, and he would always want to be asking questions uh, about what it is that we know and with a lawyer's mind. Uh, and I must say there's a lot of similarities between the legal profession and the analytical profession as far as distinguishing between what is presented as, as fact and inference and assessment and reporting and, and so on. So uh, I was there in the Oval Office for the first part of the Oval Office sessions when we had the PDBs where the intelligence was presented and then the intelligence briefers would, would leave and then we would have the discussion among the advisors with the president about, okay, now that we've been served up this platter of intelligence goodies, what are we going to do to address it? And uh, there was a lot of back and forth Early on in the first year or so, I think there was a lot of effort on the part of the new team at the White House to try to understand how we got to where we were, uh, what are some of the, the various uh, considerations and implications of certain actions. But uh, I found that uh, working in, in that position at the White House, I was uh, frequently uh, the only non-lawyer in the room <laughs> because a lot of uh, the individuals uh, were uh, steeped in the law. And what I was trying to do was to bring a, an intelligence uh, perspective and experience to it. And uh, I remember getting a call when you became uh, director of the CIA, and I will not name my source or method, having been trained, trained by you, but um, saying, I can't believe it, he's naming a lawyer as deputy director of the CIA. What the heck is he thinking? And then you not only did it uh, once, you did it twice. Your, your two deputies have both been uh, lawyers who did not come from the agency. What were you thinking, and what was the decision making that went into that? Well, I have been very fortunate to have three very good deputies during my tenure at CIA. Michael Morell, who was a longtime CIA professional, who retired, and then Avril Haynes, who I had worked with very closely. She was the NSC legal counsel, uh, and I worked with her intimately when I was down at the White House, and so when I had to select somebody, I was uh, very impressed with her, and not just her, her legal mind, but also her intellect and uh, her grasp of, of issues. And, and then when Avril was uh, taken away from me by the White House to become the Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, David Cohen from Treasury was somebody else who I was also very impressed with. And both of them had that legal training, but also were, were steeped in a lot of the issues that CIA was dealing with. Uh, so I have found that in the work we do today and given the complexity of it, uh, I greatly value uh, my Office of General Counsel, and I have a terrific uh, lawyer there, Caroline Kress, who also worked with me down at the White House. So I tend to you know, bring on board those individuals who have demonstrated, I think, a, a breadth and depth of, of knowledge, not just of the, the law of this country, but also uh, of the uh, issues that we have to deal with on the national security front. So I just find it uh, reassuring, maybe, to have individuals who are, are steeped in not just the law, but in that, that training and the intellectual rigor that goes along with um, the, the need to make sure that we are carrying out our responsibilities to the full extent of the letter and the spirit of the law. How do you, in your current, in both your positions in this administration, there have been decisions to take disruptive actions, sometimes through criminal um, prosecution, sometimes through sanctions or other means. And in order to take the action, it necessarily means disclosing sources and methods in a way that, uh, although we do our best to protect them, are going to make it more difficult for your collectors in the future. How do you approach that type of decision? Well, I can remember years ago before NSD was set up, and even before 9-11, there were constant debates and battles and arguments and fights between what would be in the intelligence bucket uh, in terms of the secrets that we need to protect in order to be able to pull the thread to get more intelligence. And those who are, who are arguing, no, we need to make sure that we're using this as evidence for the prosecution. And it, it really was being seen and presented and by both sides as an either or. And I remember I had a very uh, good discussion with, uh, with uh, someone who was uh, um, in the national security environment and who gave me a very highly technical explanation about uh, what lies at the heart of this matter. And he says, that information that's, that's available and this great debate about whether it's evidence or intelligence, it really is stuff. It's stuff that's available to be determined whether or not it's going to 
aid in the prosecution of these individuals that's going to be able to thwart an activity, a threat, and reduce the risk to this country and to our people, or it's going to be able to be leveraged for continued use in terms of getting additional information that's going to help us to pre prevent that, uh, that threat. And it's not an either or. And I think what NSD has been very good at being able to do is looking at that stuff and being able to help the rest of the, the, the community who have, whether it be prosecutorial responsibilities or intelligence collection responsibilities, to leverage that stuff that can fuel and empower the continued efforts on both those tracks. And I, I think having an awareness of what the other side's interests are and understanding what the equities are, it really has, I think, opened up people's aperture on both sides to recognize that we're not just trying to exclusively focus on prosecutions. We're not just trying to exclusively pro focus on collecting intelligence clandestinely because intelligence for intelligence sake does not advance US national security interests. It has to be used for something. So I think having that balance and that discussion so that you can preserve frequently the availability of that stuff for both, I think we have come, quite frankly, light years from where we were before, where there was a battle and it had to go on either side of that ledger. Do you were a Homeland Advisor speaking about uh, battles over the ledger um, during the, um, uh, the so-called tempted Christmas Day bombing, Abdul Muttalib, and there was a great uh, I remember debate well. <laughs> <laughs> over whether to use the criminal justice system at all, um, when, when it would be appropriate. There was um, a debate over uh, Miranda, um, and it, walk us through a little bit about uh, how, how that hit you from your perspective at the time and the seat you were sitting in and what you think about the use of the criminal justice system afterwards. Well, I can vividly recall getting the, the call at home um, at about, I forget what it was, maybe noon or 11 o'clock on Christmas Day when I was preparing the Christmas dinner for my family, when all of a sudden we found out that uh, somebody, uh, somebody's underwear was on fire on a plane in Detroit. And uh, there may be something to this. So I had to rush down to the White House, and uh, I didn't see my family for the next at least 24 hours or so. And we were really trying to figure out, first of all, what the facts were, what it was that we were dealing with, and trying to understand how we're going to deal with this individual and how he should be handled. And quite frankly, there were, the, all of these instances are rather sui generis. And you have a playbook, uh, but damn it, <laughs> a lot of times these individuals don't follow that playbook in terms of the, what they present to us. So. I think there was a real interest in trying to understand exactly what Abdul Muttalib might be a part of and what might else might be out there. And so uh, there has to be the ability of individuals on the ground to be able to make some decisions about how a person should be dealt with, handled, and uh, trying to, again, balance the requirements for Mirandizing somebody and where that should be done and by whom while at the same time recognizing that the government's responsibility is really to protect the welfare and well-being of its citizens and the importance of trying to get uh, information. So I remember being in my office in the White House and uh, talking to a lot of folks and then also seeing people on the TV who were talking about it, uh, and it wasn't the people who were involved in the investigation, it was people on the outside who were getting briefed, so it was quite frustrating. And I do think each one of these instances provides us lessons about what is it we need to do to continue to refine the process, both in terms of what we should do, as well as what's the decision-making process that should be utilized in order to satisfy our tremendous thirst for more information so that we are able to deal with a, a rather dynamic and breaking situation, but at the same time, not doing something that's going to jeopardize the ability for us to be able to successfully prosecute somebody who has landed on our, our shores, our, our land. So I, I have many memories of that, and uh, looking back on it now, uh, were all the decisions that were made the right ones? Well, I think in hindsight, I think there are some things that people would have done differently. But I, I do think that uh, the people who were involved in this were really trying to uh, balance those, those equities that uh, come into play whenever something in particular happens on our soil. Do you, um, there have been vast technological 
changes during your tenure, I want to focus on one, which is the growth on digital communications and social media. How would you, what's your assessment of the current terrorist threat, and how would you say it links with those technological changes? Uh, uh, ISIL uh, is a much different phenomenon than Al-Qaeda ever was. Uh, as and Al Qaeda presented a very serious and strategic uh, threat to this country, and I, because of the great work of the, the community, we have been able to degrade and dismantle that organization. But right now, the phenomenon of ISIL is one that has not followed the model of Al Qaeda. It is uh, an organization that has been able to gain momentum very quickly in terms of taking over large swaths of territory and declaring a caliphate, something that Al Qaeda never did. But, and I have uh, equated it to uh, some business models that are out there, which is uh, uh, ISIL really has a very diversified portfolio. Um, it has a, an insurgency that is uh, still uh, underway inside of Syria and Iraq, despite the fact that a lot of territory has been taken away from it. It has an external operations uh, compartment, uh, component, that is trying to carry out these uh, activities inside of, of Europe and other places outside of that theater. But also, it has a very active uh, acquisition strategy. Uh, as the, these franchises have popped up in a number of areas, uh, and they have gained uh, quick momentum, it's because ISIL has been able to capitalize on existing terrorist organizations. Uh, so for example, uh, you have uh, an Islamic State of West Africa, which was Boko Haram. You have uh, ISIL in the Sinai, which was Beit al-Maqdis, an uh, established uh, terrorist organization inside of Egypt. And you have other elements of that in different uh, countries, whether it be inside of Libya, it was Ansar Sharia, that were able to basically take and then raise the ISIL flag as a way to capitalize on the ISIL brand. So it, it is very serious. Uh, uh, it continues to propagate. But I must say, I think we're taking some of the steam out of the engine by going upstream and uh, dismantling uh, the organization, taking off the battlefield a number of, of key leaders. But there's also a generational difference between ISIL and uh, Al-Qaeda. Uh, it's been 15 years, or even 20 years, 25 years, since uh, Al-Qaeda really emerged. Uh, there is a younger generation within ISIL, uh, just like a younger generation within our intelligence community and law enforcement community, individuals who have grown up in an era of great technological change and advancement and where social media is second nature to them. And so they have much, been much more sophisticated, uh, savvy, uh, as well as expert in the use of available technologies, applications. Uh, encryption now, end-to-end -end encryption is available as it was never before. And uh, I must say that they are really quite adept at leveraging those uh, technical capabilities in order to apply their trade, whether it be to, to exhort, incite individuals who have never even traveled to that theater to carry out attacks, lone actor attacks, uh, for propaganda purposes, for communication, for the narrative, to uh, market themselves uh, globally. They've also made very great use of mass media in terms of knowing that they can do something in the streets of, of Belgium or, or Paris, and immediately it's going to be transmitted worldwide uh, on 24-7 news networks. Uh, they've taken full advantage of, of that. So the, the type of challenge we face from terrorist groups today is much different than it was, let's say, back in the, in the 70s or the 80s when we were dealing with uh, Palestinian terrorism or Hezbollah. Uh, it's the technological advancements and the available, uh, availability of these mechanisms uh, that can transmit, conceal, uh, hide uh, what it is that they're doing. And uh, from your perspective, do we, have, do we currently have the laws in place that allow uh, your folks to do what they need to do to collect intelligence to protect us? Is our framework in the right place? Now, my mantra lately, and I give Justice and FBI and others a lot of credit for trying to address this issue because this truly is, I think, what needs to be the premier national discussion and debate going forward. What is the role of the government in this digital domain in this cyber environment that is owned and operated 90% by the private sector. And I don't think we have a national consensus right now about what the role of the, the FBI, Homeland Security, the government as a whole should be in trying to protect that environment. We have known for decades, uh, centuries, if not millennia, what the role of governance is in the physical space, as far as on our streets, seaports, airports, whatever. 
But that environment, that digital environment, which does not respect sovereign boundaries, and which the government does not own a control, and also which is increasingly limitless as we're going to be connected with the Internet of Things, uh, there is, unfortunately, I think, a real um, um, argument right now between the, the, the far poles of this uh, debate, which I think um, mischaracterize the, the government's uh, role. And there needs to be an understanding that if we're going to protect privacy and civil liberties, which is what this country is founded upon, and if we're going to ensure the future prosperity of this country, we need to understand and have a general agreement and consensus on what the role of the government is in protecting that environment, how we're going to do it, and what are going to be the, the boundaries, the limits, and the laws that are going to undergird that. And I do think the ultimate answer is going to be an unprecedented partnership between the government and the private sector, because there's not a government solution to this. But if our way of life, if our country is going to be dependent on the security, the reliability, the resilience of that environment, the government cannot just hope that all the various private sector actors are going to fulfill their responsibilities. And particularly when our critical infrastructure, uh, the SCADA, the industrial control systems, other types of things are plugged into it, the government needs to be able to protect that environment just the way it's, it is responsible for protecting our, our shores, our streets. And unfortunately, I think there are intentional misrepresentations on both sides of this issue. And the, the issue of you know, end-to-end encryption and, and hard encryption, I've been at conferences where I've heard technologists and entrepreneurs talk about the government's opposition to strong encryption. And nothing could be further than, from the truth. And I'm sure that people have said today, the government wants to have that strong encryption, but also the government wants to be able to understand how it's going to fulfill its obligations uh, under a framework that is based on the rule of law. How is the FBI and Justice Department going to carry out its responsibilities when a government issues a, a, a writ from the bench to be able to access some information and it's not technologically feasible? or it is inviolable from the standpoint of getting access to the information. So technology has really helped advance the human condition, but it has complicated also the ability of the government to protect for the, the common welfare and the good of this country. And I do think before we face a devastating uh, event that really is going to, I think, vividly demonstrate to everybody just how dependent we are on that environment, we really need to have uh, a, a, a real true national debate on this. And I, I have encouraged people to think about a commission, a national commission, that would look at this uh, comprehensively and come up with some good recommendations about how we're going to proceed, both from a government perspective as well as from a private sector perspective. Only with that, open it up to some questions from the audience. Oh, good, I can leave. <laughs> oh, I think a microphone's coming to you. Mr. Director, I think that we spent about $4 trillion on the war on terrorism, and we gave these terrorists 70 reasons to die for, and can we give them one reason to live for? <clears throat> well, there's a lot in that question. Um, <clears throat> can we give the terrorists one reason to live for? Well, I think uh, the reason why a number of these terrorist groups have been unfortunately successful in attracting individuals to their distorted ideology and distorted interpretation of various religious faiths is because they seem to have uh, been able to prey upon societies that have been affected by corruption, by lack of opportunity, by lack of, lack of uh, political engagement and involvement. And uh, it is uh, something that I think we're going to be faced with for a number of years to come, that a number of these societies and countries abroad that have some real challenges in terms of political reform, economic reform that are necessary in order to give 
the, the majority of their populations what it is that they are uh, um, aspiring uh, to achieve, uh, there are a, a lot, a lot of um, <clears throat> opportunities for these terrorist groups to capitalize on those, those problems and issues. Uh, to me, I like to think that you know, the United States has demonstrated through the course of, of time that we take very seriously are the obligations and responsibilities that go along with what I refer to as American exceptionalism. My definition of American exceptionalism may be different than others. I don't think that we as people are better than others. I think that we as a country, though, have been tremendously fortunate and blessed to have the, the resources, uh, the, uh, the people, the, the world's melting pot. We are, without a doubt, the world's superpower. With those great capabilities and those great blessings, I think there are responsibilities and obligations to try to address uh, the world's ills. And that's why there are a lot of criticisms about what the US is or is not doing in a number of these other areas. But when I look at places like Syria, in my 36 years working on security issues, it is the most complicated issue I ever have encountered because of the many, many internal actors, external actors, the uh, sectarian tensions, the, the, the problems that have beset that country for so long that were suppressed because of an authoritarian regime under Bashar Assad. Uh, and then the Arab Spring sort of opened that up. How are you going to uh, address and resolve those issues is really challenging. And a lot of people have complained about uh, the inability of the United States to go out there and to resolve a lot of these issues. Well, I wish we had that magic wand. And, uh, Despite the, the challenges that we still face there, uh, good on the United States for trying. Good on the United States for continuing to try to reduce the humanitarian suffering and the bloodshed that is there, and uh, recognizing that we don't have the solutions that can be imposed and forced upon the people. Uh, and so this is still going to take, I think, a number of years to come. And unfortunately, there are individuals who opt for uh, violence and militarism as a way to uh, push forward their agendas and to try to uh, uh, achieve their aims, again, which are uh, perversions of uh, religious faith. So I think that they're looking forward. There should be a lot of reasons why individuals in these countries are going to try to change the situation in their countries, but it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, we still now are working through our democratic systems here inside the United States, and I wish there were a light switch that we could just flip and all of a sudden democracy is going to flourish in these countries. Uh, again, the Arab Spring ushered in a new phase in Middle Eastern history, but there's still a long way to go before uh, democratic principles are going to take root there and the economic, political, social, cultural, and other types of reforms are going to be able to address what I think are very, very serious challenges. We have time for just one more. Hi, um, my name is Tara McKelvey. I work for the BBC. I'm wondering now that we're getting towards the end of President Obama's term, if you can tell us about the drone program and some of the things that you've learned over the years. I have talked about the drone program many times, and uh, including when I was at the White House as the President's assistant. Uh, drones, predator platforms, remotely piloted aircraft. They are piloted. They happen to be piloted from a remote location. They are tremendously powerful and uh, capable uh, platforms and instruments for a variety of things. Um, for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, ISR, uh, that can observe uh, situations as well as be able to collect uh, signals uh, and intelligence. They also are powerful platforms for delivering ordnance onto target, and they have been part of the US military arsenal for many years. They have tremendous capability as far as surgical precision and being able to have what's called persistent dwell over a target so that you can observe a target and gain increasing confidence that who you are targeting is indeed the person or the persons or the target that you intend. Also, you can observe what happens on target when the missiles are launched from the rails of the platform and to see whether or not there might be individuals who might move into the, the kill area. And so then you can redirect that ordinance away from that target. So exceptionally capable platforms that are 
weapons of, of war, and uh, the United States and other countries have those platforms in their inventory. What I think we're seeing now is a proliferation of that type of technology that allows uh, these platforms of different types of sizes and capabilities to be used for a variety of purposes. You know, right now, people are thinking about using them, and they have been used for delivery purposes, so that you could plug in the geocords into the platform and send it on its merry way and then be delivered. There are a lot of implications of the growth of this, this uh, capability in terms of how it's going to be regulated, how it's going to be deconflicted with uh, aviation and other types of, of traffic. Uh, there is the miniaturization of it. There is the increasing capabilities that those platforms can have, in addition to delivering ordnance and ISR and uh, delivering packages. Uh, there are other types of things that can be used uh, for, with them. Uh, they have been used to great effect uh, in order to search for lost people or lost uh, um, vessels. Uh, and so I think this is, again, just a, a demonstration of how technology has fundamentally changed our day-to-day -day activities and how we have to be thinking about these technologies in terms of all of the good that can accrue from their, their use and propagation. But then, as intelligence professionals, we have to, to look at the sunny sky and say, OK, now a cloud can form over there. And sure enough, uh, it will. And what we have to do is to be thinking about how these technologies and these capabilities can be used and exploited by adversaries, whether they be nation states or organizations or individuals, to cause harm and to uh, pursue some uh, evil, nefarious ends. Please join me in thanking uh, the director of the CIA for joining us today. Thank you so much.